Now it's pretty crazy, it's June 3rd, and I just heard about uh, the state of Iowa, the DNR, um, really making trail cameras illegal. At least cell cameras, and it's interesting how it's worded, and it seems like sometimes these states word things very gray, and then they have to be interpreted by the court of law to figure out exactly, set this precedent that this is what we meant by that. And so for me personally, you know, I don't hunt in Iowa, but at the same time, um, I wouldn't want to follow anything gray. So if, if it were a gray line, whether you could use a cell camera or not on private land or public, I just wouldn't use it because I don't want to get in trouble um, in any way. I uh, can't afford to, don't want to, it's not who I am. I don't want to, I don't want to push things. But bottom, and, and if you do, that's fine. I say not saying that's a bad thing it's just that i can't i lose everything you know if i get caught with a game violation doing stupid stuff so i'm just not going to not even gonna come close to it um and what i heard and it's just it's june 3rd that's just i heard about this in the last couple days and and really what they did is you can't leave anything overnight on uh, public land so that takes out most trail cameras and you can't use any i'm going to get the words wrong here but in the act of pursuit or while you're actively hunting, you can't use uh, a cell camera. It's uh, an extension of your phone. And, and that's the way it is with a lot of electronics in a lot of states. For example, walkie talkies, um, you know, Dylan's hunting over there. And I say, hey, Dylan, I call him up on the walkie talkie. And I said, hey, that inside corner over there, we're gun hunting. Um, you need to set up because the big eight's going to be going through there. He's headed your way. He's got to go through there. There's nowhere else for him to go. And so Dylan, half mile away, comes in and sets up. And lo and behold, he shoots it. You're using an electronic to aid you in hunting. And they've extended that to cell cameras right or wrong. This is not a debate about that. Um, what I want to make a video about is in, in even the act of pursuit of hunting, what does that exactly mean? Well, I don't know. It's going to be, have to be interpreted by the court of law, and, and I'm probably not even getting the wording right at that. Some have even said that, for example, a cell camera, you, take, you remove the app from your phone, and then you just look at the pictures after hunting at night. Well, if those pictures are aiding you in shooting that buck, are you actively hunting at that time? Probably not, so I don't know how courts would interpret that. Um, but bottom line is for me personally, I can't be gray. I have to just take the side of caution. So then I get comments on YouTube and people say, how are you going to hunt? What are you going to do if you can't have cell cameras? What are you going to do if you can't use trail cameras? Well, cell cameras in particular, I'll just go back to the way I hunted the first 35 out of 40 years or 36 out of 40 years that I've been hunting. Um, I don't know if this is my 40th year or is my 39th, I believe. So you know, let's say I started using cell cameras four years ago. Well, I'll just hunt the same way. I shot the same target box. I shot those box. It's just different. Um, I wanted to point out that, for one, the concepts we teach on this channel are all the same. The hunting concepts, uh, hunting back by bedding areas in the morning, food sources in the afternoon, layering bedding, how you should perpendicular and access your stands in a perfect, perpendicular movement to the actual deer movement, uh, setting up lines of movement between, you know, on private land, bedding, feeding, on public land, find those movements between bedding, feeding, and between bedding and bedding as bucks are cruising. So all those concepts are the same, hunting the weather, and I could go on and on, not creating nocturnal bucks, um, having uh, season long food that peaks in November on private land, looking for the food source of the moment on public land. Public land, uh, the buck I shot last year in Pennsylvania, we don't use cell cameras. Now someone sent me a, a camera picture of it and video uh, later, sent Dylan one of it too, which is crazy. It's small, small world. Uh, we drive 14 hours to hunt and, and we're getting, we're shooting bucks on public land that someone else uh, had pictures of. Bottom line is, don't change your hunting tap tactics in any way. And when it comes to public land, I'm going and setting up on a spot where I believe is a good funnel. If it's during the rut, I'm hunting a funnel. It doesn't matter if it's constriction of habitat where it gets thick and there's big open habitat that connects to open habitat and I'm hunting that thick area in between. The inside corner of a field or idle field, uh, maybe you have a clear cut edge and a, an open hardwood edge and I'm hunting that clear cut line, the change of habitat line where all those different habitats come together on the edge of a swamp, that's where I'm hunting. 
The bottom line is because there's no cell cameras or trail cameras or the potential of it doesn't mean I'm going to change how I hunt. It's going to be the same way. And I use this stand location as an example. We have a lot of bedding going down on the inside over here. We have a big food source behind Dylan, approximately 150 to 175 yards away. This is an area we do not enter during hunting season out of this 67 acre chunk. There's a thin strip over here of 10 acres. It's really open. It's near a road and deer just don't bed. That's how we access. So when I want to come into this stand, I'm going, to, I'm going to do this in the morning. I come in this way. You can see this road coming right up here. I'm going to access and then I'm going to sit in that white oak right there. Just don't have the, the family tradition ladder stand up there yet. But I'm going to come in and hunt this for a morning stand. We have a, a mid-morning stand out here. If I want to come in here later and I have winds going this way, for example, then I could come into that stand, a post-daybreak stand entrance, where I'm coming in a half hour after daylight. There's nothing in the big food source over there. I go right to that stand location and then blow my scent out into the field because I don't expect deer to be out into that open food source during the daylight, during at least the morning until about two hours before daylight or about two hours before darkness. So I'm going to hunt that stand the same right there. i hunt this stand right here. That redneck out there that's at the back of the big food plot. I'm going to get in there and hunt the afternoon. That's the afternoon set. I don't want to get in near there. That's why I'm coming in this way, opposite direction from where I'd come in in the afternoon over there. I'm leaving this area all alone. So I come back here in the morning. It's near bedding. I can blow my scent that way off the ridge, that way off the ridge. So I get a, a lot of wind advantage, over 180 degrees wind I can hunt this with. The morning stand. That's a post daybreak stand entrance. And then the redneck out there for gun is an afternoon stand location. And then when you get down the valley of a water hole about 500 yards away from here, like this water hole, and that's for afternoon hunting and it can be double as morning hunting too. So we take this system on this 67 acres and this is one side of the hollow on this property where we have four stands for afternoon or evening or morning bow. And then over here, afternoon gun over here post day break stand, stand entrance and back here more pure morning where we can sneak in here and hunt blow our scent off the sides wait for the deer to come back to us because it's closer to bedding none of that changes the difference is i would be just like i did back in the 80s and 90s we go look at the ag fields sit on the edge watch a hidden area hidden corner and see what bucks are coming out with binoculars. Bring a pop and a snack and watch and see what's coming out. We drive the roads around here still today, see what bucks are out there. You get to know those bucks, and I'm not even talking trail camera, you just get to know them from year to year, even if you only have, get two or three glimpses of them. You know that's that buck, and then you see him in the summer, yep, that's that same buck. It's in the same summer area, you know he's gonna come in the same fall area. Let's say you could only use trail cameras in the off season. Again, and not in the active pursuit of hunting. So let's say it was the off season. I just want to know that that buck's alive. I see that he's alive. I already patterned him from the year before, maybe the year before that, waiting for him to get to that age of maturity. I already know he's in this area. For example, we're in uh, Southeast Minnesota, the state of Minnesota. You know, God forbid they say we can't use trail cameras anymore. There's a buck we call Junior. He's out here. He has a long brow tine on one side. He's a nice 10. I passed him up right over there. I passed him up over there. He should be a beautiful five-year-old buck this year. He's one of my main target bucks. Junior lives around this area. And I know he'll be here in daylight, end of October, November, a few, a handful of times. I can only hunt here with certain winds. I'm only going to hunt here when the weather's good. I'm not going to hunt here on a super hot day, the end of October, November. I'm going to hunt after a cold front, which is what I preach. I'm gonna come here and hunt. I could get four pictures of Junior this summer and know what he looks like, put all the cameras away and come in here and kill him on a cold front morning and early morning and say, I'm gonna come in here and I have a good chance of killing Junior because I know he uses this area, I know he's alive, and then you come in here and shoot him. So I'm not saying that I don't wanna have trail cameras, whether it's SD card or cell camera. What I'm saying is, how we hunt all these stands and what we do doesn't change at all. And if I go out on public land, when I'm hunting public land, it's a little bit different. Guys that hunt public land a lot say, well, we never name our deer. We seem to think that's silly. Well, they don't have people they're sharing the land with, lots of bucks that they manage, and they watch from year to year to year to year, sometimes four or five years in a row. 
and they have to talk about these bucks. You can only use the big eight, the big wide eight, the heavy eight so many times before they run into every other deer you have out there and get very confusing. So you name them. It's all the difference. A lot of times you can tell the difference between a public land hunter and a private land hunter, but that goes kind of to reflect how you hunt on public land. If I go to hunt public land, I'm just hunting a mature buck. Mature being all relative. Is it a three-year-old in that year, that area, a four-year-old, a five-year-old? Kind of gauge that by the rub sign, the sign that I'm seeing in the woods. More rubs, more scrapes equals older buck, older age class. That's a proven fact. So don't really need to have those cameras on public land. I love having them. I want to have them. But bottom line is, it doesn't matter if it's on private or public, the same hunting concepts, the same hunting strategies apply. Just changing how I scout and make sure that rub sign pops up in, in an area. The, for the mature bucks in here, you'll, it'll be reflected by a lot of sign, a lot of good sign. UP of Michigan, public land, could be that you're in Kentucky, big open hardwoods of Pennsylvania, down in Arkansas. Look at big rub faces. And then you look at the backside and a little bit higher, look for gouges. That tells you there's stickers, kickers up there. A lot of times in, in low, uh, low value soil types and habitat areas, those bucks don't start to get non-typical characteristic, characteristics until they're an older age class, four years old plus. So you start seeing those gouges in trees and you can say, wow, that buck is wide. He's the face of the rubs right here, that antler sweeping around behind and gouging it out on the back side you just know that's an older age class you look for sign look for hoof tracks these three fingers right here clean track not a running track you find a clean track i'm looking for one right here here's a clean track right here just a clean nice track by my boot print if these three fingers fit inside it's an older buck and they don't they can't fit in there could be a Im immature buck could be even a mature doe. But when you get an older age class of buck, it's a huge track. You can't go by a running track right here. This is a running track. Toes going that way, toes going that way. That buck's just running. If you start to look where he's running, I'm sure we could find another running set of tracks up here, another running set of tracks up here. You want that clean track. And if those three fingers can fit inside in that clean track, here's another one of his running doe, do, uh, is one running toes right here. So he's running, and just because you see that and you see that splayed out doesn't mean it's a big buck. Pellets, look for big pellets, lots of them. Not mixed with small, because if they're mixed with small, it's fawn. Bottom line is, same hunting tactics. Your verification of those bucks might be different. Maybe we get back to watching and sitting on the field edges looking for deer. Maybe you only watch deer in the off season. Maybe that's legal with trail cameras. You just need to know that buck's alive. You pattern them from the year before, and then you got them. A lot of these mature bucks that we see out here, if we know their patterns, we know they're alive, then we have a pretty good chance of killing them the following year. So think about it. Let's hope that the interpretation of the law, the state of Iowa and other states that might follow allows us to use cell cameras, trail cameras, that we can enjoy using them. A lot of that's for inventory. It doesn't affect hunting strategy. I'm not saying I don't want them, but I'm saying if we don't have them, especially cell cameras, I'll just hunt the same way I did the other 95% of the years I've been alive and hunting. It's not going to change one bit. Strategies don't change. Don't fret. Sorry if you came here with more information. I searched online a lot. I'm sure there'll be more information to come, but when there's a lot of gray area to laws and regulation, it has to be interpreted by the law, and we might have to wait for that to happen. Hopefully not to you. It definitely won't be to me. I'm going to enjoy hunting either way this fall and continue the tradition of hunting, pass it down to my kids, enjoy it with my loved ones and friends, and I hope you do too, no matter what happens with trail cameras. It's Monday, and that means big shipment time for seeds. We have a lot of orders over the weekend, and Daryl in New York, he bought a lot of seed. In fact, a lot of this pallet is his. We've shipped to 48 states so far. We haven't shipped any to Alaska and Hawaii, but Daryl, we have some extra goodies coming your way. We uh, appreciate it. We'll try to do that every week too. So we really thank you guys. This is that time of year. We have lots of seed going out the door. Wes is working hard behind me, getting that out. And we try to get that out the next day after your order.